Hi, I'm Wes, the Explosion, and this is the Backlog. This week, though, rather than clearing anything off the list, instead I played through Pokemon Shining Pearl for the Nintendo Switch. I talked about this last week, so long and short, it is a remake of the Gen 4 games. I played through the main story, streaming it over on the Victory Tricksters, and I plan on uploading some highlights here, but the big thing is that I took down my love, Cynthia, and became the champion, so I can give a pretty good rundown on things. That said, I'm not sure I can answer the big question here. Is the remake worth it? There are so many things that I like, often countered by so many things that I hate, and quite a few things that just confuse me. So let's go over it and hopefully I can give you enough information that you can decide for yourself on whether it's worth it for you to pick up either this or Brilliant Diamond. So yeah, it's a remake and it kinda raises the question of just how faithful a remake should be. While there are some concepts that are expanded upon, some quality of life improvements are added in, and some things are pulled in from newer Pokemon games, there's a lot that hasn't changed, to the point that I'm almost disappointed. The big thing worth pointing out is that, as far as I can tell, the Pokemon that were in the original Gen 4 games from 15 years ago are the only ones you can get here as well. Every other remake in the series has had whatever was in the mainline game's counterpart, sometimes with even a few new things added in, such as one or two new Pokemon or forms. This feels a bit underwhelming, but after Sword and Shield had so many cuts, I'm not sure how much I can complain about this. Maybe they'll add in later with paid DLC that you don't need to buy to be able to get it, you just need to pay if you want to have them in without having to beg people for pity trades or buying the other kind of underwhelming paid service that does things that we used to get for free. Then there are the visuals. The overworld has that sort of chibi style and I'm somewhat reminded of Link's Awakening remake. That said, given that that was remaking a very old Game Boy title with combat, changing the way the sprites looked too much in that game could have fundamentally changed how it played as well. Here though, the graphics could have been revamped while keeping the core gameplay the same so it wasn't as necessary. And don't get me wrong, I do find this style cute, it just kinda gives the impression that this might have been more of a way to cut corners and make the game more cheaply. This is further reinforced by some of the full character models as well, which show up almost exclusively in the turn-based battles. Some of these look pretty good, an obvious 3D upscale of the old DS ones. Some others look really bad, some textures just slapped on, looking super unnatural, and others with parts of the models looking awkwardly stuck together. I'd say some of the biggest offenders are the odd looking flames on Ponyta and Rapidash, and the odd mouths on Wooper and Mr. Mime, which aren't actually 3D indentations on their faces, but just a surface graphic stretched across their faces. Some models are fully realized though, kind of making you wonder why some got extra attention and others seem to be slapped together in a hurry. The environments are also kind of a mixed bag. It seems like they were going for a square for square remake, which leads to square patches of grass that seem kind of outdated, and yet some parts of the setting seem to receive quite a bit of care, with some floors having super reflective surfaces and there being slowly passing clouds, casting shadows from above. The dialogue also seems to be pretty much identical, and good lord is it awkward. At one point, the main villain walks up to you from out of nowhere, gives you an abridged version of the Sinnoh creation myth without introducing himself, and then just wanders off again. I know that Pokemon is normally pretty full of non sequiturs, people walking up to you and telling you about their love of shorts or about their recent breakup before immediately jumping into a pet fight, but I feel like normally, major characters at least have some logic to what they say. Here, most seem to talk like children, just saying whatever's on their mind without reason or pretense. I mean, I know it is a children's game, but I feel like there's a very major difference between for children and by children, so this feels a little inappropriate at times. In addition to that, no extra dialogue or interaction seems to have been added since the original games. I mean, I do know that these were Diamond and Pearl remakes, not Platinum, but there were a few extra scenes from that that could have been added in without rewriting the story that added a bit of extra personality to the region and its denizens. Like the extra bit where Maylene passes you on your way to Snowpoint, talking about her cold weather training and friendship with Candace, and the Team Galactic rally before the big showdown, both could have been included without necessitating the need for something crazy like the Distortion World, and feels like another glaring omission. 
Honestly, kind of makes me question if we really need remake versions and wouldn't just be better served with a deluxe redo of the third version of the gen instead. The music is also about what you'd expect, upscaled versions of the originals sounding a bit smoother and more crisp due to the gaming systems having much better sound options these days. Since Diamond and Pearl already had pretty solid soundtracks, ranging from pretty good to downright amazing, it's a very pleasant game to listen to. Now moving on from what they kept the same, let's talk about what elements they took from the four generations of game that came after Diamond and Pearl, as well as what they didn't. We'll start with the three most contentious choices, the first of which is the experience share. Right from the get-go, each conscious member of your party gets experience for every fight regardless of who actually did the battling. This leads to quick level ups, even for your bench warmers. Affection is also back, and this time, rather than having a special, interactive function to increase it, it's just combined with friendship level. You increase this measure by just doing really basic things with your Pokemon, such as walking with them in your party, giving them items, letting them hold things, and having them battle. Your rewards for doing so are occasional battle benefits, such as extra critical hits, free dodges, status cures, and refusing to faint. Lastly, after you either catch or defeat a Pokemon once, when you're choosing your moves against them in the future, the menu will tell you how effective each move is. I wouldn't mind any of these if they were optional, but as of right now, there's no way to turn any of them off, and each of these features make the game considerably easier. Sure, this is a children's game, but a lot of adults who grew up with Pokemon play these too, and many of them like to challenge themselves. There are many different rule sets, most famous among them the Nuzlocke that don't allow for these features, so not allowing for them to be turned off can ruin the game for a large portion of the audience. Personally, while I don't mind the XP share and affection, since I see them more as time savers and rewards for treating my pretend pets well, I would have liked to turn off the weakness and resistance reminders, since I do like to try and remember those things on my own. Something that I don't think anyone will argue isn't an improvement, though, is what they did with HMs. HMs were always something that sounded cool on paper, but were massively annoying in games. For those who don't know, HMs were a way to teach your Pokemon a hidden move, which would give you not just a move that you could use in battle, but outside of it as well. For example, use cut in battle to hit your opponent, use it outside to cut down small trees blocking your way. Then there's also Surf, which will hit everything on the battlefield with a wave of water, but outside of that would also allow you to ride on the Pokemon's back to cross oceans. A neat idea that makes a lot of sense since if your Pokemon can manipulate water in battle, why wouldn't it be able to do the same outside of it to help you? It gets super annoying though since given all the obstacles you have to contend with, you'd need to take around one Pokemon, sometimes even two, just to be able to navigate a particular dungeon and when you only have six spots on your team, each one is important. Not only that, but given that erasing one of these moves could potentially softlock you, you couldn't just get rid of them but needed to find a specific NPC to delete them for you. When they got rid of it in Gen 7 and replaced them with the Ride Pager, which would summon a Ride Pokemon to perform the same action and leaving you with the utility of HMs without the hassle, I don't think really anyone complained. They kinda do that there, with HM learning being gone and instead you summoning a wild Pokemon, normally a Bidoof or a Barrel, to come and perform the move instead. While I do like the ride pager more, at the same time, I am immensely thankful that I didn't need to drag around two otherwise useless Pokemon with me in order to get through the end of the game. On the other end of this equation is the return of single-use TMs, which teach a new move to one of your Pokemon. They started making them infinite use in Gen 5, I believe, and was just a general improvement overall. This gave you more options for raising Pokemon and letting you set them up how you wanted. Now though, if there's a set you want to run, you better be pretty sure that's the Pokemon you really want to use the TM on since you might not get a second chance. Some of the TMs are up for sale in some spots, though I don't believe all, and you do get multiples of some which help a little, but why they went back to this is confusing and mildly annoying. The movesets for this gen already felt pretty limited, with only some being updated with newer moves and the fairy typing, and with several of my party members having very limited and less than ideal options for their typing, this just further restricts things. Oh, and just so we don't skip past it too fast, yeah, fairy type is present along with several of its moves, even though it wasn't introduced until X and Y. So that's neat. Another little quality of life thing is that the game autosaves, though I never pegged down specifically what triggers it, so some players might want to turn it off if they want to save scum. Because they were nice enough to make that optional. 
You also have some character customization. You have the option to choose between two genders with four choices for each. The standard pale skin, dark hair, the pale with blonde hair, the tan with brown hair, and the dark skin with dark hair. And your mom will share your skin tone, which is a nice touch. You can also change clothing. So far I have access to the standard outfit, an early purchase DLC one, 10 I can buy, and one for beating the main story, though more could show up later. Each outfit is well thought out and looks super cute, at least for the girl protagonist. This is another thing I have mixed feelings about because in the original game you had only boy and girl to choose from and here you have options, just very limited ones. In the past few generations, the character customization was much more robust, you having more options for hair, skin, eyes, and clothes. Here though, the outfits are much more detailed and well thought out, so that might have been the trade-off. I am happy that we do have options, I guess I just wish we had a few more, either letting us choose different colors for each of the costumes, or letting us cycle through a few presets. Overall, it's definitely more of a good thing than a bad thing, though I might just be getting greedy. I just really like the cyber getup, but hate the orange and dark brown color scheme. If only I could do something with purple and maybe black or gold? They also brought back the fan favorite feature of allowing a Pokemon to walk behind you. This is one of those odd things that really, it doesn't add much to the game, it just gives you an extra sprite and some flavor text if you talk to your PokePal, but hey, I like it and so do countless other fans. It's a fun little touch that makes you feel closer to your favorite party member and also more integrated into the world and as dumb as it is, I am very happy they included it. As for what's missing, they no longer have fast methods for EV training your Pokemon, like Super Training or the Pokepelago or ways to buff your IDs, like the bottle caps. It's a bit complicated to try and explain what I mean by those, so if you're unfamiliar, just know that they're tools to help people get Pokemon for competitive play. More glaring, though, are the emissions of the GTS and Wonder Trade. The GTS stands for Global Trade System and allows a player to put a Pokemon up for trade for one they're looking for, or do the reverse, searching for a Pokemon they're after that another player has listed in exchange for whatever they're after. This feature was vital for completing your Pokédex if you didn't have a ready trading partner. Wonder Trade was a system that would let you randomly trade a Pokémon of your choice with another player for whatever they wanted to put out there. This not only let bratty children get rid of their Rattata and Bidoof, but was also a great tool for breeders since many would use this to get rid of rare or nigh-perfect Pokémon they were breeding, giving others who did likewise good material for hatching their own perfect builds. While both are extremely disappointing to be missing, the GTS was first introduced in Diamond and Pearl, so it feels really unforgivable that it's not available here. Sure, there is something called the GWS that's there, but isn't usable yet, presumably to be patched in later, but it's been such a staple for such a long time, why it wasn't there day one, and if it'll even be the same thing, given the different acronym, is confusing to say the least. Now for the two big things that got buffed this release. Super Contest and the Grand Underground. I did very little of Contest in any of the games they were available in, and I only tried it once here so I could talk about it. You can pick and then plant berries, and those berries can be used not just in battle, but also to make poffins, which you can feed to your Pokémon to boost their appeal in a certain stat. You can also put stickers on your Pokéballs to give them special effects when your Pokémon come out. You can then do Super Contest in one of a number of categories, and you're judged based on what your appeal level in that is, as well as how well you decorated your ball, which move your Pokemon decides to use, and how well you can keep up with a sort of rhythm minigame. I can't speak too much on this because I don't like farming games, even simple ones. The Poffin creation strikes me as a waste of time, and since I like to raise a lot of Pokemon, I don't want to decorate that many Pokeballs. That said, this does seem more robust than what contests were previously, and I do kind of like the rhythm minigame, even if it is kind of simple, so in my limited experience, this does seem like an improvement and I think some players will have a lot of fun with it. What I do have a lot of experience in is the Underground, and now this game's Grand Underground. As the name implies, you go under the ground, and are able to dig up treasure in the tunnels therein. You use your maps to find out where there's treasure buried, and then you start a minigame where you dig into the wall and try to find everything that's buried before your efforts cause the wall to collapse. It starts out pretty limited, with you only having access to a few paths and only being able to dig up pretty basic stuff, but as you see more and more of Sinnoh, more opens up to explore and the drops from excavation get better. 
I find this super fun since you never know what you'll find, from statues to evolution stones to fossils and more. This and shiny hunting are about the closest I'll ever get to gambling since there's the thrill of being surprised at what you'll get without the risk of getting nothing at all or ruining my financial stability. As you travel the underground, you'll come across enclaves which feature different biomes and Pokemon. Unlike the random battles above ground, here you can see the wild Pokemon walk around and either choose to avoid or battle one in particular. This is pretty neat because you can sometimes find rare Pokemon this way that would be a pain to come across otherwise. Normally to get a Munchlax, you need to buy honey, place it on one of the four trees that will spawn one, wait at least six hours, and then hope that the slim chance that one appears comes true. Here though, you can get lucky and if you keep a sharp eye out, you can find one just walking around. The levels down here also scale, though I couldn't tell you if it's based off of how strong your party is or how far you are in the game. This makes it a good grinding spot. That said, a lot of the same Pokemon will appear over multiple biomes, so it's not as much variety as I would expect, though that's really the only complaint I have, and it is a nitpick. The Grand Underground also features secret bases. You choose a place to dig a hole into the wall, and voila, you have your own custom little space. This is a bit of a letdown though, because in the past, you customize your space with furniture and dolls, among other objects, giving you a cozy little hidey hole. Here though, you can only fill them up with Pokemon statues, which you get by digging up, as previously discussed, and pedestals that you can buy to place them on. If you place a lot of a certain type of Pokemon in your base, that type will be more likely to show up in different enclaves. I think this is a neat idea, but I would have preferred that they did this in conjunction with the furniture offerings of the past. As it stands, it just makes your secret base more like a storage space than a home away from home. Overall though, I do think that they improved Diamond and Pearl's unique features nicely with these two functions. Now for the game's difficulty. After all, Gen 4, especially Platinum, are considered some of the hardest mainline Pokemon games there are. This is another point that the game seems to be having an identity crisis with. On one hand, there are those things I already mentioned, the experience share making it easy to get over level, the affection system letting you win some fights you should really lose, and your battle menu more or less telling you what you should and should not use. The AI also doesn't seem to cheat. If you're about to switch out, it won't change whatever move it was going to use to one that benefits it more, and you can actually trick them into making bad plays. On the other hand, there's the limited TM and moveset thing. There's also the set of tutorial battles, which I swear should have been gimmies, but instead of two Abras that can only use a move that has no battle effect, instead they have a pretty nasty attack that not only does decent damage, but lets them set up. Then there are the gyms where, instead of just prepping for a certain type of Pokemon, instead you go into the Steel Gym and get surprised by an Azumarill that's only justification for being there is that it knows Iron Tail. Or you take a Garchomp into the Electric Gym and get hit with a dazzling gleam from a Mr. Mine that probably knows Thunderbolt or something. Hell, even the leader for that gym has an Ambipalm. And the Fire-type Elite Four has five Pokemon, only two of which are Fire. Speaking of, they really up the Elite Four. All of their Pokemon now have held items, not just their aces, and many are healing ones. I can't tell you how many had leftovers. In addition, quite a few have stall-out strategies, which especially suck when you need to take on multiple trainers with no breaks. Heck, you start out against the Dust Stocks holding Black Sludge with the moves Light Screen, Toxic, Bug Buzz, and Moonlight. If you're not a huge Pokemon nerd, that equates to someone poisoning you and then just trying to stay alive long enough for you to faint without really needing to do anything else. And some others in the Pokemon League are worse. Then there's Cynthia, my love, who has always been notoriously hard. I hear that post-game, they also have buffed rematch teams for even greater challenge. So yeah, I really can't tell you if they set out to make this the easiest or hardest Pokemon game in existence. All this leads me to the unfortunate conclusion that this game was probably pretty rushed to make it out before Christmas. It would explain the high level of polish on some things and just other lack of care on others. The missing features, the lack of direction on some things, that chunky monkey of a day one patch, and the bugs. Did I mention the bugs? I encountered a few movement bugs personally, sometimes getting pulled into some doorways or over ledges like they had a tractor beam, and also getting caught on some objects and having to stop for a moment to let the game realize that, yes, I can walk between those two rocks or something similar. There are also some glitches that let you slip through some things like bridges or ledges. Look up the Snowpoint Gym for the most famous example. Then there's the Pokemon and item duplicate bug that I hear hasn't been patched out yet. 
The game also seems to have trouble loading, your character suddenly stopping as a wild Pokemon encounter or trainer battle take around a second to activate. I also have to question how much of this was playtested, some areas having an absolutely maddeningly high encounter rate and the underground enclaves having weird Pokemon hitboxes and some objects taking up more space than they visually should. Hopefully these bugs and maybe even some of my complaints get patched out later down the line, but overall, the game just feels very unfinished. Again, the quality just seems so all over the place that I can't help but think that they meant to make something really great, but just ran out of time, which I think is disappointing for all parties. I was really expecting this game to be incredible. Game Freak gave the title to another company, so I assume they would do all that they could to make a really good impression so that they might get more work from them, though I'm willing to blame the deadlines for this. There's also a streaming group that I follow that normally doesn't have permission to play Pokemon games on air, but they have it for these, so I figured that meant that Game Freak was really pleased with the games and wanted to show them all to a large audience. And don't get me wrong, overall I did enjoy Shining Pearl. At its core, Pokemon is fun, and Diamond is one of the games I really enjoyed, so replaying an updated version was a joy. I guess I was just expecting more, the remake being much more basic than I thought they would be, there being quite a few technical issues, and so many of the decisions just being so baffling. I really can't recommend or discourage anyone from playing this game, but you know what, I don't think I need to. I think I did cover most of the factors that would either make this game appealing or not, so I think most people can make that judgment for themselves based off of what I've said, so go ahead, decide for yourself, and maybe even let me know in the comments if I was able to steer your decision in one direction or another. Oh, and because this series is supposed to be about my own experiences with the game, here's a quick rundown. The main story took me about 24 hours, though my playtime clocked in at just over 30 due to playing the underground as well as trying to fill out my Pokédex for a good chunk of time. I used set instead of switch settings for extra challenge and I didn't change back even when things got really tough on the Elite Four. I chose Piplup as my starter but boxed it about halfway through the game. I made the game harder on myself by changing Pokemon pretty regularly and spending most of my money on clothes rather than items that would have helped me catch the box legendary or beat the Elite Four. Speaking of, it took me about three hours to beat the league. The first run getting all the way to Lucian, then failing at one of the first three on my subsequent runs before finally making it to Cynthia my love and after preparing to save Scum, narrowly beating her on the first try. My team was an overleveled Lopunny with less than ideal moveset, named Dawn after the original protagonist, a Luxray with poor nature and ability that would somehow always come through for me, named Mewtwo after my cat. A strong but not really good for the Elite Four Toxicroak named Booba because of his poison sack. A Garchomp that I swapped out for the Gibble I had been raising at around the point of the 7th gym named Hector cause Fire Emblem. A Kabutops that I got a day before the league and used because I wanted to named Freddy, mostly after Kruger but also kinda Mercury and Cromarty. And a Miss Magius I caught a few hours before the league named Agatha after old people. I really wonder how the endgame would have gone if I didn't have terrible luck with natures and abilities and hadn't played the game like a total complete jackass and or moron. Maybe I'll swap versions with someone at some point and try to play a bit smarter. For right now though, that'll do it for what I thought of Pokemon Shining Pearl, so thanks for watching, maybe subscribe if you enjoy this sort of thing, and perhaps I'll see you in the next episode.